Hi, thank you very much. Um, welcome to this session. My name is, um, are people are still sort of slightly wandering in. Hi, Philip. Hello, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be chairing uh, the session this evening of Andrew Abbott's lecture, public lecture. Um, this is a, a joint lecture uh, put on by the Department of Management and the Department of Sociology and we're very pleased that it's a kind of joint enterprise and we hope that there'll be many more such joint enterprises. Um, Andrew Abbott is uh, a distinguished professor from the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago and as I'm sure you're all aware, he's made um, very original and interesting contributions in a wide range um, of topics and areas. He's probably sort of best known, and I never know whether this is a good thing to say, I, mean, I feel ambivalent when people say this, you know, but I mean, I'm, I'm sure you all know his book on um, professions, uh, the system of professions, which is kind of the classic in the sociology of the professions, really, but he's also um, written extensively on methodology in the social sciences um, and in social theory more broadly, and there are many, many books. I'll just mention Time Matters because I think it's a very nice anthology uh, discussing some of these issues. One of the other books he's written is called Department and Discipline, uh, which is a book that combines a history of the University of Chicago Sociology Department and uh, talks about the American Journal of Sociology that he's edited uh, since 2000. And for those of you who aren't sociologists, actually the Chicago School of Sociology is really... Um, for many of us, where sociology started and very much uh, very important to us. And in a way, sort of, Andrew is an exponent of kind of continuing that very rich tradition in sociology. Throughout his work, his approach really has been characterised by a processual and ecological perspective. And he's also promoted lyrical and humanistic impulses within sociology. And these themes are reflected in um, the many, many projects that he's still engaged with, um, continuing interest in occupations, in library studies, the sociology of knowledge generally, and social theory. And I'm particularly delighted that this evening he's going to sort of speak broadly in social theory, talk about his current theory. And the topic for tonight, which is absolutely intriguing, uh, is scarcity, abundance, excess, towards a social theory of too much. So um, I really very warmly um, welcome Andrew Abbott uh, to the LSE, I should say. Thank you. Thanks. I'm very glad to be here. Um, and I uh, hope I can uh, live up to this, uh, this uh, very kind introduction. So many great problems of our era are problems of excess. Massive pollution, sprawling suburbs, a lot of information. Yet our social theories and normative arguments mostly focus on scarcity. Budget constraints, trade-offs, impoverishment, these are concepts of scarcity. Confronted with excess, we nevertheless make scarcity the center of our attention. Now why this should be so is an interesting question in the sociology of knowledge, but it's not my topic. Nor is my topic the origin of problematic excess itself. Rather, I want to refound social theory on the premise that the central human problematic is not scarcity, but excess. Such an approach would resolve numerous problems in social theory. First, it would be ex ante conformable with the many empirical problems of excess and glut that confront us. Second, it would enable us to see how our scarcity theories prevent effective analysis of crucial social problems by rethinking in terms of excess issues like poverty and domination we might find completely new approaches to old questions. It's useful to begin with definitions. I'm going to use the words scarcity, abundance, and excess to refer respectively to having too little of something, having an unproblematically sufficient amount of something, and having too much of something. And since the phrases too little, enough, and too much identify not absolute amounts, but amounts relative to a standard, I shall employ other words, rare, common, and countless, when I need words for absolute levels of availability. I'm going to omit all consideration of whether countlessness is good or bad, copious versus superfluous, or rareness, good or bad, unique versus meager, or even commonness, good or bad, ample versus <coughs> adequate. Our scarcity, abundance, excess vocabularies are, of course, very extensive, and in the full paper, I explore them. Too much, actually. But to avoid confusion, 
In what follows, I shall use only these two trichotomies, rare, common, and countless, for absolute levels, and scarce, abundant, and excessive, for levels related to some standard. In this terminology, the task of the paper is to reconceive social theory around the problem of excess, to argue that the central problematic of social life is not having too little of something, but having too much of it. The paper has three main sections. The first reviews the role of excess in classical social theories. Then the second section focuses on two things. First, the reasons why excess is not simply the reverse or obverse of scarcity. And second, what the mechanisms are by which excess creates problems. And then the third section deals with the strategies that we use to deal with those problems. Very brief conclusion, then we cast some traditional scarcity problems as excess problems. So to begin with social theory. It's no secret that scarcity has played a central role in classical theories of society. Throughout Western philosophy, there's been a long-standing puzzlement over whether excess is good or bad. Aristotle thought that abundance gave citizens the freedom to discern the true public interest, while the authors of Deuteronomy thought that only scarcity would keep the children of Israel on the path to righteousness. Plato's concept of divine and positive abundance descended to Leibniz, Schelling, and Bergson, but Kant and Schiller, by contrast, noted the perilous quality of our emotional reaction to the sublimely excessive force of nature. Novelists have also divided on the issue of excess. <coughs> in The Sorrows of Young Werther and René, Goethe and Chateaubriand, respectively, began that praise of emotional excess which would dominate much of the 19th century. Yet, this very insatiability of human emotions became one of the core problematics of modern fiction in figures like Emma Bovary and Catherine Earnshaw. In social theory, our focus on scarcity has more immediate roots in the literature of political economy. As we read the political economists from the 18th century forward, we see excess recede into the background as scarcity takes center stage. To be sure, from Mandeville onward, excess, or at least abundance, is the desired end of an economic system, but the motor forces of the system begin to be located in scarcity. Now in Mandeville, excess is in the first instance personal. Mandevillians seek personal luxury. They lust after individual excess. Social abundance, whether of goods, employment, or, as Mandeville implies, of happiness, requires this personal vice, this dishonest appetite, this striving after excess. Bare virtue, he tells us, can't make nations live in splendor. Now, although Mandeville's main argument is about personal luxury and excess, he also shows that societal abundance, he does not discuss really ex societal excess, itself requires as motive power the unworthy pursuit of personal excess above all else. Mm -hmm. By contrast, in Adam Smith, wealth, which seems to denote a seemly abundance rather than a Mandevillian excess, has become a mere result rather than an individual motivator. For Smith, personal motivation lies in truck and barter on the one hand and a rather generic self-love on the other. Smithian individuals are not Mandevillian sybarites, but sober businessmen, not consumers, but investors. And the most important abundance is not the abundance of, at the individual, but at the social level, since Smith is answering the mercantilist's claim about the wealth of nations. He's not particularly interested in personal abundance or excess. Glut and overproduction, the social level excesses, do not seem as apparent to Smith as they do to Mandeville. And of course, he doesn't imagine the Victorian industry that will soon make glut a reality, if a rather badly distributed one. But Smith makes another important change. At the level of the individual, he emphasizes division of labor, which is occasioned by differences of talents as realized through the propensity to truck and barter. Despite his overall focus on abundance as a necessary and desirable social product, Smith's attention to division of labor opens the possibility, impossible for a reader who has read Smith's successor to avoid, of conceiving an individual level mechanism through which not individual excess, but individual scarcity and competition will produce social abundance. The Mandevillian appetite for personal excess, however, disappears in Smith, replaced by sober division of labor and self-love. But the next step on this path seems inevitable. Now it's Malthus who takes that step. The first excess in Malthus is the social excess of human bodies. And on the surface, Malthus's argument runs from the social fact of excessive population to the individual experience of scarcity and starvation. But in fact, his argument centers on scarcity from the first chapter, with its famous contrast of the arithmetic increase of subsistence with the geometric increase of population. Unlike Smith and the Mercantilists, Malthus has no interest in the many good things that excess population can bring to a nation, 
military strength, cheap labor, and so on. The wealth of nations does not concern him. What concerns him is only the disproportion of population and subsistence and the consequent scarcity experienced by individuals. The social excess of population is merely a piece of this larger, foregrounded situation of scarcity. Malthus thus turns excess into a literal obverse of scarcity, which it is not in either Mandeville or Smith. Now, Malthus made his inversion quite deliberately, pitching his argument against what he saw as the overly optimistic social theory of the Enlightenment. The philosophes had expected society to be positively transformed by excess, and in particular, by excess, even superabundant knowledge. But on his first page, Malthus mocks the Enlightenment notions, like great and unlooked for discoveries, or increasing diffusion of general knowledge, or the ardent and unshackled spirit of inquiry. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's getting that right now. This, these things will amount to little, he thinks. Malthus thus turns on its head M Mandeville's optimistic view of the substantive excess that will be produced by personal vice. In Malthus, luxurious desire produces not plenty, but want. The only restraints on the negative excess of population are the immediate forces of scarcity and destruction, want of food, pestilence, war, unwholesome manufactures, unhealthy cities, and so on. In his concluding chapter, Malthus tells us in no uncertain terms that, quote, the general tendency of a uniform course of prosperity is rather to degrade than to exalt the character. For him, as for the authors of Deuteronomy, scarcity is morally desirable. Formalizing Malthus, Ricardo produces the theory of scarcity that has sustained economics since. On his first page, he notice, notes scarcity as one of the two sources of value, labor, of course, being the other. Moreover, the Ricardian analysis of rent, probably the most influential section of the theory in the long run, is rooted in scarcity. That which is excessive or even abundant is worthless for Ricardo, however useful it may be. He's uninterested in the actual use of things. All that matters is their exchange value, and this lies in scarcity. Now, from the other side of the political fence, Marx, too, focuses on scarcity. Das Kapital is one long meditation on scarcity. Declining wages and class conflict are all about scarcity. By focusing on distribution alone, Marx turns the Malthusian argument that the perennial problem of society is the scarcity of subsistence into the socialist problem that the misallocation of socially superabundant production leads to personal scarcity for the majority of the population. Personal scarcity is again central. Marx managed thereby to ignore what was the central reality of 19th century economics, the sudden <coughs> excess of British production in both agriculture and manufacturing, an excess so large that all of India was necessary to absorb it. Even empirical economics managed to ignore excess. To be sure, the emergence of a fully developed capitalism made the business cycle into a well-formed problem by the end of the 19th century, and in the business cycle, glut is fully as problematic as scarcity. But in the usual argument, the problem with glut was actually a problem of scarcity. Glut of products meant not only low prices, but more importantly, scarcity of employment. Thus, the main line of empirical economics growing out of liberal political economy retained Ricardo's and Malthus's focus on scarcity as the central aspect of the economic problem. Outside the mainstream of economics, there did arise a line of scholarship that treated excess of goods simply as a distribution problem continuing the socialist view of scarcity as artificially maintained, but taking a more optimistic view about ending that maintenance. Excess of goods meant a lack of livelihood only if the excess could not be gotten at without wages. This line of upbeat mainstream economics began with Simon Patton, who published the book The Theory of Prosperity in 1902. John R. Commons followed Patton's lead, and by 1930, John Maynard Keynes was asking what humans would do with themselves in a few decades when productivity meant that they would need work only two or three hours a day. Keynes meant to be optimistic, but later writers turned his message negative. In 1958, John Kenneth Galbraith warned us all of the dangers of the affluent society in terms reminiscent of Malthus and Deuteronomy. And despite overwhelming evidence of economic growth, the ma mainstream managed to retain its focus on scarcity. Even overwhelming excess of goods could be turned into scarcity for purposes of analysis. The brilliant Gary Becker turned Keynes on his head by incorporating time itself as a scarce resource in utility-maximizing behavior. Excess of leisure goods thereby disappeared behind the scarcity of time in which to enjoy them. As the conjuncture turned, however, so also did the role of excess in economics. In neoliberal thinking, Mandevillian excess would arise at the top of the income distribution and then trickle down 
creating a well-regulated Smithian pl plenty for the middle classes while the poor could struggle in Ricardian squalor. Thus the wheel had turned again and the concept of social excess disappeared behind a neo-Mandevillian economy of personal excess. And while the actual social relations of neoliberalism were based on personal excess at the top of the pyramid, scarcity remained central to the ideology of neoliberalism via its role in the economic theories legitimating this new economics. In summary, excess has seldom been a focal topic for formal economic thinking for the last two centuries. Economic theorists quickly translate most problems of excess into those problems of scarcity for which their intellectual machinery is so well designed. The study of excess in economics provides a pattern repeated to a certain extent in other social sciences. Occasional interest in excess, but a main focus on scarcity. American sociology, to be sure, began with a fairly strong interest in excess. Simon Patton's main interlocutors included sociologists like Albion Small, Franklin Giddings, and E.A. Ross. The continental sociology was different. Durkheim famously took excess as problematic. In the Suicide, he speaks of, quote, the disease of the infinite. He argues that human desire is inherently insatiable and hence inherently dangerous unless limited by social norms. Quote, irrespective of any external regulatory force, our capacity for feeling is in itself an insatiable and bottomless abyss, but if nothing external can restrain this capacity, it can only be a source of torment to itself. Poverty, Durkheim tells us, quote, protects against suicide because it is a restraint in itself, end quote. It is the rich who are most in danger Quote, at least the horizon of the lower classes is limited by those above them. Those who have only empty space above them are almost inevitably lost in it if no force restrains them. In Durkheim, excess is thus both excess of desires and emotional excess and an excess of things. The unstable relationship that produces suicide arises in the positive feedback between the two. The more you have, the more you want. This is an argument that's been familiar since the Old Testament prophets, whom Durkheim, a rabbi's son, no doubt knew quite well. But at the same time, Durkheim was also following a long tradition of secular psychologies. The insatiability of human emotions has been a staple of Western psychological theory since at least the 17th century. Indeed, in his id concept, Freud would make it the foundation stone of modern theories of the self. Thus, excess in post-Durkheimian sociology tended to take on the problematic, dangerous quality of Old Testament excess. In political theory, many of the issues were the same. The incurable excess of and inevitable conflict between human desires has been a mainstay of Western political thinking since Hobbes. In the Federalists, and to some extent in their follower Tocqueville, a new obsession emerged, worry about the excessive, excessive and dangerous emotions of the myriad and manipulable common voters. We see then that while the economists generally ignored excess altogether because of their concern with scarcity, the other major traditions of social thinking have more often been concerned with excess but they've usually seen it as dangerous, only occasionally seeing it as a possible good. Suppose then we try to formalize that concern. Suppose we insist on thinking about society principally in terms of problematic excess, as is suggested by the line of socialist and progressive economics and by many of the pro practical problems we face today. This would mean a thoroughgoing reconstruction of longstanding habits of thought. For example, we would need to see poverty as a case of too much of something rather than too little. And conversely, we need to start seeing privilege as a case of being able to minimize one kind of problematic excess rather than being able to enjoy another and supposedly unproblematic kind of excess. To translate the whole thing into methodology speak, suppose we forget about the problem of budget constraints and concentrate on the problem of data reduction. So, second bit, the excess problematic. There are two separate steps to an analysis of the means by which excess creates problems. The first is the rejection of the argument, clever, attractive, but in the anal last analysis, wrong, that excess of one thing is simply scarcity of another. For example, the argument that excess of possible consumer goods is simply lack of time in which to enjoy them all. I shall call this the identity argument. Only once that argument is rejected can we begin to set forth the mechanisms by which excess actually creates problems. So this next section of my talk has two parts, the first concerned with the identity argument, the second with the actual problematics of excess. Now the notion that excess of one thing is simply scarce of another arises in a simple intuition. Imagine a set with two kinds of elements, and consequently two internally consistent and exclusive subsets. Suppose that one of those subsets contains most of the elements of the total set. 
Obviously, it's a matter of convention whether we speak of the scarcity of the one thing or the excess of the other. But suppose, by contrast, we have 10 exclusive subsets, nine of which each contain 11% of the set, and one of which contains 1%. We might still speak of the scarcity of things in the 1% set, but we would not speak of excess among the others. Indeed, if there were 14 sets, 7% containing 7% each, and then one set of 2%, we might even speak of the scarcity of any particular type, and the extreme scarcity of the one truly rare type. In sum, there's no logical reason why scarcity <coughs> has to be the obverse of excess. But the economist version of the identity argument does not work in quite this simple fashion. Becker did not simply argue that excess of goods was the same as scarcity of time in which to enjoy them. Rather, he treated time as a factor of production. Households produced utility by combining time and income. They did this in two ways. For not only was time a factor which must be used up in consumption to produce utility, it was also a factor which had to be used up working in order to get the income with which to purchase the consumption goods, which, when combined with leisure time, would produce consumatory enjoyment. There was thus, thus not only a direct constraint, you have to spend time to enjoy leisure, but also an indirect constraint, because time spent on leisure was time not spent earning income, and therefore not producing the wherewithal to buy the goods and services whose enjoyment was leisure. But this means that the average household never actually came up against the pure time constraint. Long before it could do so, its leisure would be limited by want of income to purchase the goods and services necessary to leisure. The only people who faced the pure time constraint were those without any income constraint, those whose income was unaffected by whether they worked or not. This would include the unemployable, those supported purely by transfer payments, and of course, those with inherited wealth. For such people in particular, time matters only as a factor in the production of consumatory utility, and so we can justifiably exchange abundance of goods, scarcity of time, they're the same thing. But even in this subpopulation, there are some problems with treating time as a budget constraint. Income must, produce, must purchase one thing. Buying one good forbids buying another with the same income. However, it's not clear that time behaves this way. We can certainly enjoy two pleasures at once, we can read a book while listening to music or sitting with a loved one, and so on. Although multitasking is no doubt overrated, one cannot deny that time can be multiply enjoyed in a way that purchased goods and services cannot. This multiplicity of time's uses suggests a further contrast. The classical choice situation in microeconomics involves two distinguishable goods, between which we, de we decide on the basis of two things. First, isoquants that map utility equivalent mixes of the two goods, and second, a budget constraint whose slope is determined by their relative price. But in situations of excess, we're generally making choices among many alternatives. After all, the researcher in a medium-sized research library must decide which of a million books to read. In fact, most such researchers must choose not one individual book versus millions of others, but some combination of books, of which there are not millions, but millions factorial. It's obviously silly to consider solving this problem employing the classical choice model for all possible pairs of books, half a trillion of them, actually, in a million volume library. To be sure, this classical scarcity model might approach the book choice situation by considering the choice of one book against a million possible alternatives, but the assumptions then necessary to produce the properly convex isoquants would be strong indeed. Herbert Simon's concept of bounded rationality was long ago developed to deal with this situation, but did so by assuming that the chooser, rather than optimized, simply sought a threshold level of utility. And that's a viable strategy. You just go to the library and put books off the shelf until you come to one that makes minimal sense for you. But of course, that's not what researchers do. They have complicated research algorithms telling them which books to ignore, which indexes to use, which indexes to ignore, and so on. They are riotous Bayesians, relying very heavily on the work of prior scholars. More generally, most modern algorithms for optimization in combinatorically generated spaces pursue Bayesian Monte Carlo strategies. Typically, these strategies consider the value of some point in the combinatoric space in terms of an objective function. They then randomly pursue, perturb the chosen combination following certain <laughs> rules and possibly integrating Bayesian priors and see whether the objective function improves or not. Such algorithms differ radically from the classical microeconomic model of choice between alternatives. In the first place, they're iterative, whereas the, second, the classical model produces, at least in principle, an analytic solution. 
In the second place, they make few strict assumptions about the surface of the objective function in N space, it being assumed by them that the surface looks more like the jagged topography of the Alps than the rolling hills and perfect convexity of the Cotswolds. In the third place, they do not assume unique and fixed measurability of the contribution of any one item to the objective function, but only the measurability of the whole combination of them at once. They thus allow for the value of any individual item to vary depending on what else is present in the combination. After all, the value of a particular book in your bibliography is a function of what's already in the bibliography. This allows a situation of choice with anything from absolutely distinguishable goods to close substitutes, indeed allowing substitutability itself to vary. This property of what I shall call value contextuality is, of course, inadmissible in classical choice models. We see then that for quite a number of reasons, treating excess of one thing as scarcity of another seems dubious. Excess really does seem to be something fundamentally different from the reverse of scarcity. We can therefore turn to the problem of why it is that excess is problematic. It's again useful to make some distinctions. First, as we saw in rehearsing the concepts of excess among political economists, excess can take place at two levels, individual and social. Second, excess seems to be of two kinds. One of them is excess of one thing. I shall call this surfeit. The other is excess that comes through many things, not too much, but too many. I'm going to call this welter. This twofold distinction, of course, gives us four kinds of excess to think about. Individual surfeit, individual welter, social surfeit, and social welter. So let's think of some examples. Examples of individual surfeit might be having too much money, or too much knowledge, or too much inspiration, or whatever. An individual surfeit might also be emotional, as in depression or mania, which are both forms of individual surfeit, or active, as in excessive ambition or obsession compulsion. Examples of individual welter are familiar too. Too many possible friends, too many talents, too many passions, too many topics for research, too many jobs to do well, too many moral obligations, etc. You know this. Like individual surfeit, individual welter can range from cognitive kinds of things to emotional kinds of things and active kinds of things. So also at the social level. Modern theorists of knowledge have spoken of the surfeit of things to know, and they say that's why we have specialization of experts. Similarly, they write of the welter of socially constructed ways to know the world, of ideologies, of sciences, of pseudosciences, popular impressions. Correlatively, social theorists from Le Bon Forward have seen a surfeit of dangerous emotions in crowd, as well as a welter of conflicting emotions between different crowds. Still, other writers have seen paralyzing multiple alternatives for social action. You might recall took a view on the possibilities for concerted action in democracies, as well as conflict between endlessly many alternatives, as we see in the complex party politics of the proportional representation democracies of Europe. So at the social level, too, we see both surfeit and welter. However, while these examples show us that excess is a problem at both the social and individual and social levels, and that it permeates, permeates cognitive, emotional, and active realms, they don't show how it is that excess actually creates problems. So it's useful to start from our common sense notion of the mechanism through which scarcity has its effects. This mechanism is very simple. We assume groups, humans or groups, to be entities that can feel, act, and symbolize. Each of those processes requires certain inputs to succeed. And scarcity means that some input is present in insufficient quantity. So we can't produce what's needed. But obviously, in the case of excess, such a mechanism would not produce problems. For any one resource, excess implies sufficiency. So there should be no problem for lack of something. Therefore, it must be that such inputs must not only be present, but must also be in some way selected or chosen to be used effectively in the production concern. To be sure, we could choose inputs at random, but there might be constraints about which inputs are jointly sufficient. So it could be that of sufficient resources A, B, and C, only combinations of A1, B2, and C1, and a2, B1, and C4 would actually work. That is, we may have to coordinate particular subsets of sufficient inputs. In that case, even random use will not work. Now, thus stated, the excess problem sounds like a coordination problem. And indeed, there are long familiar models for solving coordination problems, whether within the self or beyond it, markets being the most familiar. But markets function for coordination only if the things to be coordinated or allocated have prices. And prices cannot emerge without scarcity, commensuration, and an absence of value contextuality. But in the context of excess, those things are there. There's no scarcity, no prices, no budget constraints, and no basis for choice. 
And as the theory of markets arises because of a coordination problem that is indeed about excess in some sense, too many possible choices for an individual to decide what he wants, but then it resolves that problem via a scarcity mechanism, which is imposed in the form of the relative evaluation of all items on a common numeraire under some fairly stringent assumptions. Indeed, I shall later argue that arbitrary imposition of prices and rankings more generally is one of the fundamental strategies for handling excess. But a more general theorization of the excess problematic has to look behind this solution, market solution if it's to discover the nature of the problem that's really being solved. We have to theorize surfeit and welter as problems, not just ignore them. Now, at the individual level, it seems to me that surfeit creates problems for several reasons. Emotionally, surfeit creates problems through overload and habituation. An excess of one pleasure at one time may overwhelm the self, while an excess of one pleasure over time reduces the ability of that pleasure to satisfy. Cognitively, surfeit creates problems through sheer overload. A place, person, or thing could be too big to know. Yet surfeit of knowledge can also create problems by isolating an individual or by catastrophically reducing an individual's ability to know other things than the one thing that he knows all too well. In the realm of action, too, surfeit creates problems through overload. Some tasks can be too big or too complicated. And through habituation, routines can degenerate into meaningless habits. Now, one could argue that surfeit is self-regulating. Excessive things become less fulfilling, so they're less sought and hence seem less excessive in experience, and so they regain their ability to fulfill our desires. But in many examples, this argument seems not to hold. The favored ice cream loses its savor, not temporarily, but permanently. The long-lived long marriage hollows out. The long-practiced politics becomes meaningless. Habituation is not necessarily self-regulating. But thus it seems that overload and habituation are the two principal mechanisms through which surfeit creates problems at the individual level. Similar avenues produce the effects of welter. Here, the technological constraint arises through numbers. There are too many things to know, too many emotions to experience, too many possible actions. In all three cases, the self is paralyzed. There's an overload, but an overload of alternatives. Moreover, the number of available alternatives produces a combinatoric redefinition of the value of each, which depends on the context of others chosen. So value instability arises through a kind of momentary dependence of value on context rather than through habituation over time. Thus, there are again two principal mechanisms for the dangers of excess, overload and this kind of value contextuality. Now, since value contextuality is in experiential space, the same thing that habituation is in experiential time, I'm going to combine those two things under the label of endogenous value shift. Don't worry, I'm not going to do much with that later. I realize a lot of terminology here. The same mechanisms obtained at the social level, but given the different ontology, they unfold in different ways. An ethnic group or bureaucracy experiences overload and value shift in different ways than does an individual. But it remains the case that surfeit and welter work largely through overload on the one hand and through the various forms of value shift on the other. These are particularly obvious in social entities that are individuals, in the sense of being congeries of biological individuals concentric with one another, families, neighborhoods, communities, provinces, nations, and so on. But it's also true of things like ethnic groups, voluntary associations, bureaucracies, genders, and so on, that we usually imagine is constituted of abs aspects of individuals rather than of whole individuals. So for example, we can imagine habituation in political groups, the situation where you have to have more and more extreme politics in order to fan the faithful into action. Or we can imagine academic disciplines unable to deal with onslaughts of new information. Or we can imagine voluntary associations torn apart by excess of internal dissension. And of course, the problems of social value contextuality are familiar to anyone who follows partisan politics, particularly in parliamentary systems, where the po political worth of a particular policy is completely at the mercy of other policies proposed alongside it. Now, excess may also seem to be problematic because it produces conflict within and between individuals. Even in the supposedly excessive state of nature, remember Marshall Salins refers to the Stone Age as the first abundant economy, there can be conflict because of the attitude of universal possession created by an excessive world. But this third mechanism is more apparent than real. To be sure, it involves excessive individual desire, but in the world of true excess, the sheer superfluity of satisfaction should make that excessive desire the more easy of fulfillment. But most often, the conflicts we observe in apparent situations of excess are actually produced 
by strategies for taming excess. They arise in mutually shared value schemes, rankings, that lead actors to desire the same things, creating thereby situations of scarcity. These ranking schemes, as I've already suggested, are actually a strategy for taming excess. A familiar example of such artificial scarcity is the marriage market. When they first pass puberty, teenagers think that only a tiny fraction of the opposite sex could possibly be satisfactory sexual partners. Yet not too long afterwards, the vast majority of them will be married to one or another of those people whom they previously regarded as utterly unsatisfactory. <laughs> that is, conflict over supposed excess is usu usually arises from a social regime of desirability and ownership that in fact created an artificial scarcity problem. Indeed, we shall see that these rating schemes which create scarcity are developed in order to deal with the first of my excess mechanisms, that of overload with its consequent paralysis of action. Part of my aim in the next section of the paper will be to show how many social institutions that we commonly understand in scarcity terms are actually more productively construed as strategies for dealing with excess. The scarcity that they involve is deliberately <coughs> created to enable effective behavior in a situation of possible paralysis. Now, while conflict is not a third mechanism by which excess produces problems in addition to paralysis and habituation, there is, in fact, a third mechanism for excess effects, but it works only at the social level. I should call this mechanism disintegration. Now, social entities are actually lineages woven over time out of parts of personalities or social things. They are, in the simplest language, conjuries of parts of people. An excess can simply disintegrate social entities, not so much overloading them or habituating as simply undemming them, so they're no longer there in existence to be overloaded or habituated. And this is, in a sense, a third problematic aspect of excess. But principally, there are, there are two <coughs> fundamental mechanisms through which excess creates problems. First, it leads to overload and therefore to confusion and paralysis, and that make, thus makes action and cognition impossible. Or it leads to habituation or value contextuality, drift of values, both of which also paralyze through the inherent instability of their implications for action. So, what do we do? <coughs> Part three, dealing with excess. If paralysis and habituation mean that excess creates problems for social actors, there must be strategies for dealing with those problems. <coughs> there are indeed a variety of those strategies, both at the individual and social level. Broadly speaking, they fall into two types, what I'm going to call reduction strategies and rescaling strategies. Reduction strategies are those strategies that cut down the amount of excess. There are kind of two ways of doing that. A basic strategy simply ignores excess altogether. A more subtle and proactive strategy simplifies it, reduces it to tractable terms. I'm going to call these two versions of the reduction strategy defensive and reactive strategies, respectively. And I'll be going through all four of these. By contrast with reduction strategies, rescaling strategies work by changing the definition of desirability. Remember I told you that excess depends on the notion that it's more than you actually need. There's some measure there. Literally, in this situation, you define excess out of existence. These two come in a sort of simple version and a more complex version. And as with the reduction strategies, the simple version is more extreme. The simple version is to not just accept existing excess, but increase excess, make excess more and more, <coughs> and make its enjoyment the core of life. The more subtle version is more judicious, comprising strategies that contrive to make a virtue of the necessity of excess. So I'm going to call these the creative and the adaptive strategies. So I have four strategies which make a scale from the most conservative to the most radical approaches. Most conservative is defensive, denying it. Second most conservative is reaction, which is kind of trying to find a way to tame it. Then adaptation, which is kind of making a virtue of necessity and going along with it to creativity, which is, hey, we're going to go wild. I'm going to review them in that order. Defensive strategies are the simplest. At the individual level, the simplest defensive strategy is just to ignore excess. One falls back on habits of mind and simply ignores novelty difference in the other makers of excess. In the sphere of action, for example, defensive modes of excess avoidance are standard. You can act habitually. You just choose the same dish every time you go to the Chinese restaurant. You can choose randomly, the way people do when playing the lottery. You can imitate, choosing whatever is popular or whatever is the reverse of popular in the environment. Often there are ideological tools to cover up these surrenders of will, 
as the ideology of romantic love covers up the nearly random association of spouses in modern society, or as fashion rules cover up for imitation. At the social level, we see many of the same defensive mechanisms. The chief cognitive tools for social excess reduction are stereotypes, and more broadly, the traditions that constitute the cognitive habits of groups. Stereotypes and traditions enable us to save the extraordinary time it would take actually to know others for themselves. As at the individual level, randomness is again a strategy for handling excess of action possibilities at the social level, we sometimes miss seeing it. For example, many social structures have positions that will function reasonably effectively no matter who is placed in them. That I'm a professor at Chicago and by virtue of that have edited the AJS for 12 years is quite arbitrary. I could have gone to lots of other places on leaving Rutgers. They could have not owed me a job. I could indeed have stayed at Rutgers. Chicago would have found other people and other AJS editors, and sociology would look very little different. Random filling of elite positions probably makes very little difference to most social structures. As at the individual level, too, habit, known at the social level as tradition, is a dominant way of handling excess in the realm of action. We, we solve the problem of what among many things to do by simply doing what we've always done. For example, there's a strong case to be made that academic disciplines arise through just such a mechanism of tradition. And here I'm kind of unsaying my earlier theory of disciplines, by the way. Perhaps disciplines constitute beguiling islands of common concepts and methods in a vast sea of intellectual differences. The potential novelty of the world is, after all, far greater than we think. On this model, the disciplines glow, grow by slow accretion as wanderers in the ocean of intellectual possibility wash up on the shore. They then tend to stick with the tradition because no other island is visible. Canons may therefore be not so much fortresses of power as they are lonely atolls with at least the virtue of being above water. Fashion is, of course, another mechanism of excess defense at the social level. Deciding one's clothes on a purely aesthetic basis is a truly burdensome task, as a student of mine recently found out by studying the dress habits of college women. It's much easier to decide which clothes to wear because the system tells you the proper answer among other things, by not even selling the things you might otherwise consider. That is, imitation works at the social level as well. But fashion is actually a compound mechanism combining several excess strategies. To imitation are added the reactive strategies of hierarchy and markets and the adaptive strategy of serialism, <coughs> all of which I shall cover shortly. And note that fashion, as broadly defined, inc includes intellectual fashions as well. For example, the fractal mechanisms that I explored in the book Chaos of Disciplines. Now, all these methods, in effect, avoid dealing with excess altogether. They use randomness or habit to ignore the problem, or they use exchange sometimes to turn it into scarcity. But note that such methods are completely incapable of dealing with, say, the excess of ways to know the world or its more practical avatar, the problem of which books to read in the library. For such burning problems, we need a whole different range of strategies, much more drastic. These are the strategies I've called reactive. And like defensive strategies, reactive strategies for excess can be viewed at both the individual and group levels. At the individual level, we have cognitive strategies like abstraction, which reduce excess and complexity to simple archetypes. At its most drastic, abstraction can work by simply ignoring differences, a strategy that makes an excessive collection of highly differentiated things look like a re repetitive collection of all identical things by ignoring the differences between them. This is the strategy that my generation of feminists claimed was characteristic of men's approaches to them as women. All women were simply viewed as undifferentiated sex objects, not as independent subjects who had to be laboriously understood as individuals. But it's also the strategy of modeling the world in terms of homo economicus or national character or a host of other abstractions. It's, a, it's simply a general strategy. For cognitive, affective, and aff active and even affective excesses, however, the dominant reactive strategy is hierarchizing and concentrating one's attention at the top of the hierarchy. Restaurant reviews, lists in US News and World Report, university priority documents, citation analyses, uh, all these things follow a simple logic of take the best, forget the rest. Gerd Gigerenzer has argued that this is one of the fundamental modes of human cognition, if you know his work. But it is true of emotion to some extent as well. Con overwhelmed with conflicting emotional loads, one's likely to select a, few do a dominant few to experience. And hierarchy can work in reverse as well. A winnowing strategy prunes excess from the bottom, reducing a complex array of possibilities to a narrower group of serious alternatives. 
At the social level, we see many of the same strategies, although they're further structured. Consider first reactive strategies for cognitive excess. Here we don't see the strategies of stereotype and tradition, but of division of labor and specialization. Both of these tame the vast array of possible things to know. They lead to a pro proliferation of specialists of many kinds, and then there are inevitably excessive conflicts between those specialized disciplines and the groups, which are themselves structured by systematically form, systematic forms of reciprocal ignorance, which become noticeable only when they're violated, as in the human, humanist invasions of the social sciences over the last two decades. As for the myriad amateur knowledges, the subsumption of such everyday amateur knowledge by expert abstract knowledge reduces the welter of things to be known. Thus, the carefully studied history of dozens of communities is subsumed into one or two articles on typical patterns of urban development. And all that detailed work in the community history suddenly becomes defined as mere randomness or variation around the mean or other kinds of unimportant things. The huge welter of amateur knowledge is thereby turned into mere experience, unimportant. Hierarchy also permits other kinds of reductions as well. The failure of direct democracy in a group of large size can be remedied by the fractal process of creating representative Republican institutions, reproducing the mapping of individuals and their differences at a smaller, less excessive, more manageable level. Self-similarity of this sort is used throughout complex social systems as a modular and scalable system for reducing vast arrays of structural relations to instantiations of a few simple structures. Immensely complicated social systems can thereby become easily navigable and manipulable. Specialization and self-similarity can thus be seen with hierarchy as the three fundamental reactive strategies for excess reduction in terms of social action and cognition. Finally, there are a wide variety of reactive strategies for dealing with excessive social emotion. The most common of these are safety valves. The danger of excessive emotion is a long theme in social theory from Le Bon onward. Clearly, there are ex extensive social structures whose main purpose is the diffusing or channeling of those emotional excesses. Participatory sports, spectator sports, political rallies, and so on. Those who've read Marcuse's Eros and Civilization will recall that Marcuse saw the sexual revolution as in some ways repressive because it stripped sublimated energy from social critique by simply indulging it. Another strategy for the handling of excessive emotion in society is the forcing of emotion into private settings, churches, <coughs> hospitals, homes, and so on. If excessive emotion threatens the social order, sequestering it somewhere will provide an effective reactive strategy. In closing my discussion of reactive strategies, I should offer a reinterpretation of markets and democracy as both being essentially strategies for handling social excess. In both cases, the excess involved is the welter of possible activities, policies, and so on that can be pursued in a society. Markets and democracy resolve this welter by truck and barter, to use Adam Smith's famous phrase. To markets, the barterers bring differential amounts of resources depending on their labor, productivity, capital, inheritance, and so on. In a democratic polity, by contrast, all barterers bring, at least in theory, one unit of desire expressed as one vote. In both markets and democracy, the individual is assumed to have already resolved his own problem of choice in excess. That's what's involved in the assumption that the individual has a scale of preferences. Obviously, this means that an enormous amount of excess is simply assumed away. So also assumed away is most value contextuality, even though, of course, what an individual gets from the economy or the government is not a single thing, but a market basket of things, and the value of, the, whose, of, the value of whose contents may shift depending on what else is in the basket. But given this assumption of an individual resolution of the, ex, of the individual excess problem, who decided what they want, markets and democracy add a crucial simplification device, which is the measure of all these things on a single scale, the numeraire, whose shape is determined for all individuals by the shape of the expressed preferences of all the other individuals on average. This is, of course, a drastic simplification. That's what it does. It simplifies the world. We could imagine dozens of alternative ways of co-measuring individuals' preferences, and indeed those have been tried with considerable success in non-market and non-democratic societies over time. The important fact is that the kind of comparability assumption that's used in a market or governmental system is largely arbitrary. Any rule will work, as long as it simplifies the situation enough to ease the paralysis of social action that arises through inability to choose. 
So defensive and reactive strategies deal with excess problems by taming them. It's therefore not surprising that we find many of the social institutions ranged in these strategies. Markets, hierarchies, republics, and so on are all ways of taming excess by either reducing it or avoiding it. By contrast, there are many other aspects of social life that do not involve the reduction of excess, but quite the contrary, that involve adjusting to it, playing with it, even creating it where it does not exist. In order to continue my gradation from utter rejection of excess to playful creation of it, I next turn to the more subtle form of positive excess strategy, adaptation. Adaptation is a rescaling strategy. It deals with excess by changing our standard of how much is too much. That is, as I argued earlier, adaptive strategies focus less on ignoring or reducing excess than on finding it more desirable, less disturbing. Adaptation does this in a subtle and nuanced way. Again, the most familiar and obvious examples are individual ones. A common example would be surfing the web, or to give the equivalent for my generation, reading encyclopedias. <laughs> and uh, if you were to ask everybody in this room over 40 if they'd read encyclopedias, I'm sure they'd all say they did. Um, to encounter a randomly ordered source and simply read through it is to wander arbitrarily through an enormous excess of knowledge, to choose randomness as a positive good. More sophisticated adaptive strategies take the form of seeing analogies or making translations or yoking together areas of work that are seen far apart. These things are, of course, urged to the point of parody in the literature on interdisciplinarity, but they're nonetheless important strategies. Translation is not an easy business, but the access it gives to new realms bespeaks the pleasures of excess. In the realm of action, we see other strategies. The most striking of these is serialism, an obvious strategy for adapting to excess. You do different things in some order, and so you get to be all different kinds of things. Over the life course, one moves through a sequence of jobs, of friends, of romantic partners, of interests, of hobbies. One moves at different rates in different areas, but few members of the early 21st century societies <coughs> remain in precisely one place, <coughs> even for 10 years on all of these dimensions. It's true that we tend to tame this phenomenon, serial adaptation to excess, through rationalizing narratives of odyssey or self-discovery or whatever. But in fact, we just keep on moving to the end. As a result, there's nothing quite as embarrassing as reading old pieces of autobiography, um, how little we knew. And just as we're different persons over time, most of us are different persons in the many social settings in which we live. Dutiful fathers in one place, assertive academics in another, thoughtful friends in a third, pompous bores in a fourth, maybe even ardent musicians in a fifth. Indeed, the excess of selves can be disconcerting at times, although perhaps less to us than to those who know us only in one or another of those selves. But my point is that multiple selves in multiple contexts and multiple selves over time Give us, allow us to enjoy an excess of life possibilities that was not possible, possible in societies with more rigid manners and structures. It is, to be sure, it is to be sure true that these multiplicities themselves get organized, however, into life course trajectories. Thus, as a sociologist, I have to become a generative old geezer, whereas once I was a hot-headed young disciplinary radical. Well, at least I got a chance to be radical at some point. At the social level, we also find many adaptive ways of dealing with excess. We'll find, however, that they tend to produce even more excess. Thus, looking at the realm of cognition, we see the emergence of complicated translation systems between the huge excess of different symbolic systems, different languages, pigeons, creoles, dialect gradients. The same kinds of things emerge in academic disciplines and interdisciplines, which have their own methodological creoles and theoretical pigeons. Yet translation brings more and more experience into our immediate world and increases excess. As these examples suggest, translation systems themselves tend to stabilize and then turn themselves into new differences, which in turn require new translations. In this sense, to adapt to excess means committing to perpetual change, both across social differences in a moment and across different successor social worlds over time. We do have academic disciplines that explicitly aim at this kind of translation, <coughs> anthropology and history, and although it's in some quarters customary to condemn both those disciplines as politicized servants of empire, it is clear that their underlying projects aim, in ideal terms, at understanding the amazing excess of human society on its own terms. Now, there are other important forms of social structure that embody this adaptive approach to the excess in social life. Trusteeship, for example, is a social structure committing to, committed to balancing past, present, and future. But we also have things like tourism, multiculturalism, international exchange, 
Unless this sound too much like a simple recitation of the latest political claptrap, let me point out to you that in earlier periods of European history, not only elites but middle class families exchanged children across wide social and geographic spaces precisely with the aim of creating truly multilingual and cosmopolitan adults. The monolingualism of modern nation states, the US being the extreme example, is actually quite unusual in the history of human societies. And we should also recall that just because real multiculturalism is difficult to teach doesn't mean that we should not be seeing its importance as a way of dealing with the excess of human societies. Now finally, I've come to creative strategies. The creative strategies for excess are themselves familiar enough, but I don't have time to list them here. They're things like radical juxtaposition, deconstruction, hybridizing, valorization of previously unimportant differences. Are we ready, for example, for a social science of redheads? <laughs> I think it's very good. Um, extreme and facile examples of these have given them a bad name, but this should not blind us to the fact that creation and then overcoming of differences is one of the inevitable dialectics entailed by the human species' use of symbolic systems to mediate its experiences of the world. That's a long topic, however, so I should simply point out here that it's possible to enjoy and proliferate excess, thereby simply resetting the level of desirability that made excess problematic in the first place. But I must set this topic aside in the interest of saying at least a few words in closing about a couple of classical theoretical problems, translating them into the excess problematic. So let me give you a couple of examples. Consider the problem of pure com perfect competition. We all know that perfect knowledge of a system is impossible, and indeed those forms of <coughs> economics which attend to the cost of information know that perfectly well. But some people's imperfect information is better than other people's. Indeed, an excess way of thinking about economic privilege is that the people at the center of, say, the stock market as a system are people who are not swamped with bad information about the stock market. Similarly, to take a topic of some interest to me, men who are privileged with respect to prostate cancer are privileged precisely because they do not have to go to the internet to find out anything about the disease. They're not overwhelmed with useless and often wrong information about that disease on the internet, but for some reason, they know somebody, they know perfectly well how to go directly to the highest quality information, which last time I looked was not in the first five pages of Google. The privilege, that is, lies in not being swamped with disinformation, whether about stocks or about cancer. Or again, an, ex an excess way of thinking about wealth is that it saves you the problem of having to know about a lot of things. You don't have to know when the cheap flights are available, when the clothing sales are, where you can go for vacation, which restaurants at which prices, when you can afford to retire. A whole excessive set of burdensome information, prices, times, availabilities, future government policies, can simply be ignored. That's privilege indeed. Perhaps wealth is not so much about having lots of goods and services, as it is about not having to consider a vast array of constraining factors and to know a bunch of irrelevant, possibly irrelevant stuff. To have the stuff be irrelevant, I guess the better way to put it. What about competition between disciplines? An excess theory suggests, as I marked earlier, that disciplines don't compete at all. Rather, as I argued earlier, disciplines are lonely hearts clubs, where people adrift in the huge sea of intellectual possibility are just trying to find a few souls with similar preferences. New canons are lighthouses attracting the lonely survivors of, survivors of prior intellectual wrecks and sinkings. <laughs> to be sure, eventually they may get big enough to dominate the island chain, but perhaps it's much more important to see the vastness of the ocean here than the politics of the intellectual trobrianders. What about the theory of action? Here I think excess thinking provides a foundation for Eric Leifer's great insight that skill means arranging your activity so that you never have to make a rational choice. The problem with rational choice is that it's impossible given the excess of information and the infinite excess of possible futures. Skill lies in keeping open many possibilities and options, indeed in retaining an excess of possibilities. And John Paget's celebrated recoding of Leifert's principle into the concept of robust action is precisely a definition of power in terms of the creative retention of excess possibilities of action. To decide, it turns out, is to concede one's freedom to lose possibility. I hope these examples persuade you that it would be possible to construct the entirety of social theory by recasting it on the problematic of excess rather than that of scarcity. <coughs> this reconstruction would not only prepare us to address many obvious problems of excess in our society, but perhaps more important, would allow us to take new views of some traditional puzzles. I look forward then to your questions in excess. <laughs> <laughs>
one you take question? Probably sure, that's sure. Best. I'm, I'm yeah. terrible. Otherwise, yeah. yeah. Um, I, agree complete, I agree that the topic of whether excess or scarcity is a problem is a very interesting question. Uh, what I would like to get your view on is whether to answer that question, we shouldn't look at it from an ethical lens. Because what, what I was thinking is that actually what you believe about morality defines what you see as the problem. Because, for example, somebody who believes in absolute good and bad would say that whatever is absolute good in scarcity would be a problem, and whatever is absolute bad in excess would be the problem. While the utilitarianist would say, whatever makes people more happy is a uh, whatever makes people more happy is 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 more, it, as excess is not a problem. Yeah. But when, whenever it starts making people less happy, it becomes scarcity, and it's a problem. So instead of trying to say, okay, excess is always a problem, or scarcity is always a problem, shouldn't be be somewhere in the middle where it depends on the ethical view of things, um, what defines what is a problem. Okay. Well, I think I, the, the thing that I catch I, in the comment, um, so my first reaction was that, um, would be to say that, although in other work I'm worried about ethics and that kind of thing, here I'm just thinking of purely a thought experiment. What if we tried to reorganize how we think about social life in a completely different way? So my original thought was that I would just say, well, I'm, I'm not talking about ethics here. But I think what, you've, what your question has just suggested is something really interesting that I hadn't thought about, which is that in a sense, the judgment of scarcity is actually, is actually definitional. Scarce, by definition, the thing, which is, the thing which is scarce is the thing which people don't have, which they ought to have. So that, that's, and that, it seems to me, is a kind of an interesting way to to recast this, and it could be the case that that means that it's not possible to argue about this, to make this sort of purely, um, uh, purely sort of um, non-ethical, not related to ethics argument, because it could be the case that it's kind of definitionally scarcity is we simply define as uh, the stuff which people ought, ought to have but don't. I guess there, I mean, it's. it's as you can probably tell from the examples, this is just a bit of a gloss on the talk. The reason I've gotten into this stuff is I spent the last six years studying libraries. And if you study libraries, the central problem is not scarcity. It's how are you going to decide what to read? There are, you know, my, my library has um, now five million items on open stacks. How do you, how, how does that, I mean, somebody asked me when they, when I had to chair the committee to build a new library, which we've just done. Um, why should we do this? Well, how does it produce knowledge if people just go in and pull random books off the shelf? So that's where it comes from for me. That's the motivation for the project for me. But this is a very interesting question. I like that. I like this notion that, that there's this, it possibly could be that scarcity is kind of definitionally involved and definitionally ethical. It's interesting. Thanks. Okay, one at the back. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the relationship between this, uh, excess and religion? Do you think that, that religions can be structured upon the uh, strategy to avoid excess in the universe and diversity and infinity? Well, um, I actually did uh, cut on the fly um, a, a paragraph that talked about um, that one classic religious strategy for dealing with excess is um, to reduce your levels of desire to such a level that it doesn't, that anything, any random tiny thing will suffice. And so, uh, and to simply disattend to the issue of excess. So clearly, there are different religious ways to, um, to think about this. I'm right now writing a piece about um, uh, the Indian sociologist Radha Kamal Mukherjee. And it's clear that he kind of has that that sort of, um, that's the kind of the move that the individual would just merge into, um, into the world and in a sense lose uh, the kinds of boundaries that make excess problematic. So I don't, I, I guess that's not necessarily an answer. I don't have a sort of formal theory of how it works. One could certainly think in kind of, you know, Marxist opium of the masses kinds of ways also about, about this, but I haven't, I haven't done that. It's just it's an interesting thing I should write it down to, to think about. Thanks. Yeah. First, uh, thank you very much for your talk. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. 
what do you think about this relationship between excess and anxiety? Anxiety, uh, or no individual and individual and social anxiety. And second, do you think that the old society have the excess experience? So the first one is anxiety, right? Sorry? Anxiety, right? Yes. So uh, excess and anxiety. Yeah, there's a whole, clearly there's a whole kind of Freudian argument you could be, you, one could make here. Um, I haven't um, thought it through. I guess it's um, in part because I don't, I wanted to keep the discussion very abstract and, and sort of practical and not have to um, buy into a particular psychological theory or something like that. But clearly, you know, one could think about um, causes of anxiety and of excess as a cause of anxiety versus other kinds of things. Um, but I don't, I don't actually have, I just don't have a lot of thought to that. Um, as, the, as for the question of whether all societies have this kind of problem, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say yes, I think they do. Um, I think this is just inherent in, um, well, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. Are I don't you, know why. I think are you going to do that? Go with it. Because I have to say that while you were, if I could, you know, I have yeah, to yeah. say that while you were speaking, I, you know, I couldn't help thinking of Zimmel and the blasé attitude and the city and, you know, how he talks about some similar things about the experience of the city, but makes it very historically specific that it's only with the growth of the city that you get exactly the kind of overabundant, you know, daily experience. Yeah, I know that. That's that's. That's true, but, uh, but you know, I know Shizumo was right about that. Um, you know, after all, the, you know, a, a peasant who lives in a village and never goes into the market town for, you know, 10 years at a stretch has an excess of knowledge of all the stones and all the mm -hmm. particular flowers and all the particular fields. I'm not, I'm not sure that it's not a, a more general problem than that. I mean, I, I sort of see this, this thing, but I've, personally, I've come to think, to, Believe less in that in that kind of argument that this is inevitably a city thing, um, and, and so on. I don't know. I, I have to rethink it because, of course, it's all being raised by the internet yeah. as well. That yeah. the, the blasé attitude, the students blah 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 blah. Uh -huh. um, I won't even ask how many people in here have have uh, sent a message uh, during the talk. <laughs> but I'm sure it's yeah exactly. There's, there's <laughs> enough of a laugh to give you a sense of how many um. it is. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't really have a, a, a I mean, this, it's an interesting question to think about. I just don't, I don't have a lot of free associations, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you, you uh, mentioned that the theory of value in Ricardo is based on the problem of scarcity and the problem of labor. How yeah. could a theory of value would look like from the side of uh, excess? That's really interesting. Um, um, mm -hmm. I think, um, I think that's part of a gen more general issue. Um, uh, and I, let, me, let me translate it to a place where I have sort of thought about it a bit. Um, so I've done a lot of writing over the last couple of years about what to do about what seems to be the empirical fact that social science doesn't really accumulate. So you know, if, as I have done over the last couple of years, you spend a lot of time reading old social science, you feel very sober <laughs> about the fact that most of the stuff you thought was wonderful new stuff people said umpteen years before. And of course, I'm now old enough to have the experience also of seeing young people being cited for stuff that I thought I said many years ago and stuff. <laughs> um, so, and and of, course, of course, that also makes it clear to me that when I said it many years ago, I was myself doing that to somebody else who'd come before, who had also said it all before, before me and so on. So um, I think the, the problem is with thinking about if we're not going to, we're not accumulating, we're not going to find the perfect theory of society, then you have to say, well, what is a normative theory of knowledge? How should knowledge evolve over time? Should we just randomly go from here to there? Should we move around? Um, so and I spent a, a good deal of time thinking about possible criteria for good knowledge or for the evolution of knowledge, temporal trajectory of knowledge in a world where you don't expect accumulation. You expect local accumulation, little paradigm, status attainment, uh, labeling theory, uh, social networks, whatever. You'll see accumulation within those little things, but they always get 
they get to a certain point and they're kind of too, they've made some, they've gotten there by making a bunch of assumptions, then it becomes clear that really ultimately you can't make those assumptions and people start over again. But I think that um, that's a world in which there's kind of an excess of different possible ways to know the world. And so what I've been thinking about are criteria like, well, we don't want any way of thinking about the social world to disappear from the repertoire for too long. Which is sort of like saying that, you know, the process of knowledge ought to be visiting a lot of, most of the space of possible knowledges all the time. So that's an example of a value theory of an, uh, uh, what, what, what should it be? So to translate that into a, there are lots of different kinds of people. It would be interesting to have it be possible for your, you to live long enough to be as many different kinds of people as there are. That'd be really interesting, right? But you know, you can be serialist. So I mean, for example, the notion that serialism is a positive strategy, that it's a good thing to be a different thing at different points in your life. <coughs> that seems to me to be sort of an, a piece of a value theory. I mean, as it happens, you know, obviously there are um, personality ideologies. In 19th century England, the key thing was to be the same person for your entire life. And so that after you went off to the South Seas and came back, uh, 40 years later and looked very different and so on, you recognized at once your, your lover whom you had left because, I don't know, the family wouldn't let you marry or something and you, you know, pick up right where you left off. That was a kind of 19th century ideal. It's not an ideal of personality today. So I think um, the, issue, the issue with some, a strategy like serialism was how, would be how to think about good versions of being several different selves over the course of life. So I think it's a really interesting question. What, what sort, how you, would you think about a value theory? But it's not, I mean, that's not an empirical value theory of the kind that Ricardo's proposing. That's an actual, those are actual normative theories. So maybe I've just do dodged your question, I'm sorry. Um, and there's one in front here. Yes. Um, lots of your examples and a lot of your reading of economics yeah. seems to be focused on quite cognitive problems of what to, yeah. how do I know what to do? How do I know what I want? How do I know enough to take a decision? <coughs> um, and I was wondering where the concept of something like energy and power might come into this, because I, I was also sort of, I was wondering at what point you might mention something like environmental waste, or uh, it's interesting you said that actually it was libraries that got you thinking down this train of thought, mm -hmm. because I kind of almost assumed by the nature of the topic that it was actually a, a sort of, there was a kind of, a, a sort of a, a latent issue about environmental sustainability that might be motivating this, but clearly not. And it, it's sort of, and I'm just wondering, because the other thing which, which springs to mind is, is Bataille's thinking about this, which is manifestly about the excess of energy and the excess of power from which all economic and human problems begin. And yeah. the sum being the, the kind of starting point for Bataille's analysis. Right. Um, and I'm just, uh, firstly, I mean, do, does, the, does the concept of something like environmental waste or energy scarcity, uh, the power elements of the economy, which of course for Marx and so on, it was labor power, uh, trading a lot on sort of emerging theories from physics about energy and, and so on, and which were important to economics. Would that change much of what you've said if you were to sort of, if your metaphors and your examples were those of, energy and power rather than those of cognition and choice and knowing what to do how different would this would this would this be and uh, am, am i right in characterizing things in, in this way well i think that um, um so I, I clearly i could think about this in terms of uh I mean, in the first place your characterization where i'm coming out is correct yeah so i'm coming out in a fairly cognitive way i've been one of the reasons i kept saying here's an emotional example here's whatever is precisely that i knew that the it's a cognitivist account. It, it starts starts from that because I start with starting with cognitive problematic. Um, so the, the, the characterization is quite correct. Um, shifting to thinking about thinking about it all in terms of power um, and power quite broadly defined, it would be interesting to um, I think about power. The question is whether I, so one could do that within a purely um, emotional context and think about emotional power. So let's get back to the question about anxiety and actually do something with that. That's one way to think about it. Um, 
And um, at the social level, well, the social level has the problem that you have these two very different senses of the word power, one of which is ability to force other people to do things, the other which is this sort of general system, whatever. <coughs> in some ways, you know, the, by time it fit somewhat in that direction. Um, you know, it's kind of weird to think about human Parsons together. <laughs> Weird. Okay, uh, let's just set that one aside. Um, but I, um, the the relation of it to environmental <coughs> issues is just that that's not a. I mean, a, the the fact that we're all worried about excess that's just a kind of open hook at the beginning of the talk. I'm simply this is just it's kind of a thought exercise that we have all this stuff that's really about thinking about the world in this very specific kind of logic of scarcity, and yet in many ways the. Um, you know, the kinds of, kinds of uh, cognitive problems certainly we have today are basically excess problems. Um, so all the stuff that does all these wonderful things, the things that turns this garbage coming back to the spacecraft into these perfect photographs, all those kinds of things, that's all being done by algorithms which are handling gargantuan amounts of excess and turning them into all these little machines that you're able to do, to do all this wonderful stuff with. They're all produced by these, again, by um, Algorithms that are resolving these enormously complex problems. Um, so, so that's the, that's where where it's kind of coming from. So, that, for me at least. Mm -hmm. So I don't. I, I I I mean I'm kind of interested by the concept of power, and I'd have to sit and think about um, whether I want to think about it sort of as an individual personality thing, take it to the social level, and then if I do it at the social level, what concept of power uh, I would want to use. But I. So that's it. It's a good point. Oh, so there's a lot of other. Yep. Uh, hi. Um, so in your breaking down the issue, I sort of feel that you haven't addressed enough the relation between the subjective and the kind of objective perception of excess or scarcity, because I think that has been the obstacle in a lot of fears that we saw so far. Um, you know, that is interpreted as scarcity, but it wasn't scarcity for some. It was it? You know. Well, this comes back to the issue of. Of religion, religious definitions of scarcity to the question that was asked right back at the beginning about scarcity literally as a kind of definitional, um, as a kind of uh, um, normative definition of, of simply, scarcity is simply saying that people don't, it, don't have enough um, and that that's kind of, that it's always of that kind. I don't think that, um, let's put it this way. I guess my feeling about subjective and objective is that I got enough problem. I got enough balls in the air in this paper already, <laughs> and I'm afraid that they're going to fall on my head if I make one more distinction. It's com kind of completely unfollowable. So, so. Um, but it's also related to the emotional part. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it couldn't be a way because all this question that goes back to you know you divide the point of emotional. Yeah. You know, so it, isn't that the way to connect? And well, I could, but I don't necessarily. You know. I, I'm pretty um, agnostic about what I want to put under the labels of cognition, emotion, and action. I just want to think about those things as kind of reminders not to be totally cognitive. Because when I first wrote this paper, this paper has been going on for going on for about two years. It was totally cognitive, and it was only when I began to sort of force myself to think about these other examples that I would get out of. So I don't. Um, I don't want to go to a particular definition of the emotional as being the subjective, for example, because um, um, I can think about co ob objective versus subjective cognition and so that kind of stuff. So it's just th this is a it is one more distinction. I think it'd be kind of just too much to to get to get in here. That's my word. There's Sorry, I'm not not really helpful, but there's lots of questions. So I wonder, could we take two or three together? Would that be all right? Just to Speed it up. Okay. So sorry, you had one, yeah. yeah. Despite the imperial uh, claims of economy of economists, we do know that it's after all the discipline that doesn't have to say many things about the big human and social problems. Right. They can say a few things, but there's plenty of others they mm -hmm. can't say anything. But it seems to me that the theory of excess is not it is it's nearly the theory of everything. It, it makes claims to speak about too many things, perhaps, in excess. Is that a good association, or, or did I go wrong, perhaps? 
mm-hmm. uh, along the way. Mm-hmm. Got a couple more, yeah? A woman behind, yes. sorry, yeah? Mm-hmm. I was wondering whether it's possible to recast many of the heuristics and biases we discuss in terms of the scarcity problem of the computational capacity of the human brain. So in terms of looking at the individual decision maker as endowed with a limited quantity of computational resources, he then goes about and uses these heuristics to, to make an efficient allocation. Okay, and the, the chap in front, yeah? Sure, when I think about a problem of excess that we face in the United States, it seems to be one of money and politics. And I was really interested in how this is maybe a normative problem of excess, like we've been talking here, but it's not a systemic problem. All the money has been absorbed back into the political world. I wondered of those four strategies you suggest of dealing with a certain problem of success that we now face, it seems that each of those four would have a very specific outcome. So there's a kind of rejection of the problem. There's a sort of creative solution that adopts to it. So it's a very practical question that I think fits into the third section of your paper, but if you could just address the problem. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so um, um, is, am I trying to give a theory of everything? Well, I'm not trying to give a theory of everything. I'm pretending that the scarcity guys tried to have a theory of everything, and I want to try to have a theory of everything they had a theory of. Um, so, um, I mean, usual. this is the usual thing. This is a, it's a kind of crazy exercise. Those of you who have read my book, Methods of Discovery, know that one of the basic heuristics in that book is, you know, just say the reverse of what everybody else is saying and see what happens. And that's kind of, that's kind of what I'm doing here. Um, and uh, so it has this kind of loose edges and stuff like that that, that, uh, that have, have their problems. Obviously, you know, one way to say is Rome's not built today, it's not going to be fixed out. So I, I think um, to a certain extent what you're saying is this is a sort of ramshackle quality to the argument, perhaps, that it's uh, pretending to be more tight than it seems, could be, yeah. But I don't, um, I don't think it's a theory of everything, no. I just think that it's uh, a theory of someone it will turn out to be a useful theory to have and to take seriously. Um, this, I think, leads <coughs> directly to the issue of computational power, heuristics and biases. Obviously, the reason, the reference for, the reason for the reference to Garrett Gigerenzer is to, to talk about that. Garrett's spent his entire career you know, demonstrating that um, this particular take the best algorithm is probably one of the central um, fundamental heuristics that humans use to, to get through hugely complex environments. Um, so there's clearly a literature uh, about that, this, again, which is sort of could suck one in on this sort of highly cognitivist way. So I mean, I, um, if I wanted to take the paper and shape it purely in this kind of cognitivist line, I could do that. But I, it would lose me a lot of the notion that trying to actually rethink um, things like uh, markets to say, how could I think of markets as not really being about scarcity, but as really being about trying to solve a, uh, an excess problem. Just it's a new way to think about markets. Um, uh, so, so, but obviously, I mean, you're, you're quite correct that if there's a whole computational power argument to be made for this, and you could make the same argument for uh, that that's what markets, markets do, is they essentially, essentially enable action, they enable calculation. Um, now the last question, I wasn't really clear what the problem was. It, what you <coughs> said, each of the four strategies could apply, could be applied to the problem, but I don't know what the problem well, the was. The problem just of excess money in politics. It seems we've had a huge expansion of sort of investment, right? Billion dollars for each candidate in the last. Presidential oh, that kind of candidate. thing. That kind of thing. Yeah, that particular. I'm I'm just trying to pick out a specific issue, right? a political issue and say, okay, well, you've outlined four potential strategies or four uh, sort of a typology of oh, responses. Oh, yeah, it's interesting, yeah. So, well, but that's interesting because it suggests um, what, I mean, what I mean when I'm saying uh, responses. I'm talking about responses that are trying to control th- things, but I'm not talking about responses which are trying to bring about political change. Which may go back to the the, quest, the way the question was asked about about um, uh, you know let's say climate degradation or something like that. Uh, so I'm just I, I personally I just never think about those kinds of things. So um, I'm seeing these techniques much more as just um, how, how does society kind of get by 
rather than trying to think how would uh, I just I, I guess I just don't I, I don't think of it as a certain these are not <coughs> recipes and we could I mean so yeah, right you could be recreative <laughs> no. no I won't go there. Um, uh, uh, but I, I guess the, problem, the point is just I don't see these as really being strategies that are strategies for making some political happen. I see them as strategies for enabling society to sort of you know, continue going on. I mean, I don't want to say functioning because everybody will yell at me about <laughs> functioning. But not evolution. Um, well, um, kind of excess. Good kind of excess. I don't know. I don't, I don't have a whole political theory here. Yeah. Hang, on, hang on, we've got, sorry, I've got two, sure, sure, sure. two big waiting at the front here. Yep, yep, okay. Um, I think you'll partly answer this by uh, talking about the kind of thoughts that you're engaged in, but I, I wondered a little about um, whether you're right to look at excess and scarcity as two sides of the same coin, in the sense that you could say excess is a problem, scarcity is also a problem, but a different kind of problem. And they only look like opposites if you're looking through a kind of economic lens which homogenizes anything as a certain amount of stuff. Um, and you might instead say, well, excess is not an economic problem as such, it's more <coughs> a social psychological problem of sort of how we choose, how we regulate ourselves in certain circumstances. Um, and the result of that might be that you, you might be right to <coughs> emphasize excess as a subject of study, but possibly not to say that it changes or invalidates our an understanding of scarcity. Okay, next. Oh, we're speeding up now. We've only got a uh, uh, couple of minutes left. Uh, how, how do you view the movement, right? Uh, the strong food movement in Italy, like a com community movement, try to be independent and self sufficient? Okay, do you want to chuck yeah. yeah. So, um, I was interested by the idea that uh, the imposition of rankings is a means of dealing with excess. And one of the things that we talk about in sociology at the moment is how it is that we have a proliferation of rankings. We have an excess of rankings coming up. And so I was, but I was wondering, I was looking at this as a different way of explaining how it is that more rankings come up, because we usually explain it in terms of cultural change. It's just becoming a society's concerned in a cultural sense with ranking to a greater extent. And I was, you know, this seems to me kind of like a social <coughs> way of explaining the same phenomenon, and I'm wondering if I'm thinking of this in the right way, of thinking of thinking of what you're saying in the right way, and of thinking of it in this way. Okay, um, so excess versus scarcity, um, that's a kind of interesting point. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think specifically said that they're not direct opposites, um, and I don't, the, um, maybe I, you know, I think the University of Chicago, I've got too many economists in my, in my face to, uh, to be able to escape from dealing with them. But they seem to be like the big dinosaur uh, that, that needs, to be, needs to be addressed. Uh, and so if I were to, it seems to me if I were to, to try to make an argument that we really need to think about the world in terms of, uh, fundamentally in terms of excess rather than in terms of scarcity, my economics colleagues in a very large discipline, in a sense, would say, Anyway, this is crazy. It's just the reverse of uh, it's just the reverse uh, of uh, scarcity, and, and it's not an independent issue. So maybe I'm um, looking too much at the economists, but I think they're sir, they are one of the big actors that I have to think about. Um, clearly, in a sense, I've thought a good deal about it in social psychological and in um, again in the heuristics, uh, cognitive kinds of terms. That's clearly kind of in a sense where I've been. So. Um, I do think that it's still, obviously, scarcity is a useful way to think about lots of things. Um, no question about that. Um, there, there is a class of things about which t thinking about scarcity is not the right way to think about it. That's maybe the, the way to think about it. Um, 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 this is really a sort of an existence proof. I hadn't thought of that. Um, um, there's just things to, to think about this way. Sorry, I write, write slowly. Um, on uh, community food, self-sufficiency, those kinds of things, um, I don't have any views on that. I'm, I, I, as you'll be figuring out, I'm not a guy with a lot of uh, political whatever, so I don't have a lot of political views. I worked for the Harvard Population Center for years as a 
student on, on food issues and those kinds of things. So I know a lot about about food. In fact, I know a lot about climate change. I work for the world's leading expert on it uh, in those years. But um, but I just I don't actually have any views about it one way or another. I have a student writing a dissertation about it. Um, so I maybe could say more, say stuff from the student's dissertation. Um, as far as rankings, um, it's a social explanation of rankings. Kind of interesting. Um, I'm thinking rankings are generally being introduced uh, to discipline. Um, I see them as a sort of disciplinary strategy. I mean, uh, let's put it this way. Outside this paper, I see them as a disciplinary strategy. Inside this paper, I suddenly realize I've said something different from that. So I better start making sense between my two views of what I think <laughs> rankings are about. Um, I mean, I think culture is obsessed with this, but I also think that ranking is a way that, I mean, obviously you see this in the RAE, which I've mm. written some papers about. Um, uh, <coughs> this is clearly a, a discipline strategy. It's basically essentially a way of getting people to connive at cutting their own throats. That's what it's about. So that, that seems clear enough. <laughs> um, so I, there's a different way that I'm thinking about ranking here, um, where I'm thinking about it much more in this sort of finding something to focus on to use as a heuristic just to clear out the other stuff so we can focus on some things. Um, anyway, we could go on for ages and there's lots more questions, but as it's 8 o'clock, I think I'll draw it to a close. That's, yep. Okay. Deserve yeah, a drink now. Okay. Thank you very much.